Uh, my name is Vlastimil. Uh, I work in the core kernel team and on memory management stuff, also upstream, uh, most of memory management, and somehow I also become one of the slab allocators, maintainers, which is part of the memory management. And uh, uh, my idea is that uh, if, if I shrink the thing, it will be uh, easier to maintain. So I will be talking about how how it happened that we got three of the allocators today and why I want uh, them to go back to a single one. So uh, just to get everybody on the same slab page, uh, what are the slab allocators? These are basically equivalent of uh, your C standard libraries, malloc free, where you say I want something, some buffer of 16 bytes, 64 bytes, or uh, to allocate for a structure or for a string or for something else, and you free it with the free uh, call. And uh, in the kernel, we have uh, similar calls that are kmalloc and kfree. Uh, the only difference is that uh, Besides the size, you also have to pass it some flex, but that's not so important. Then somebody realized that, uh, I'll be talking in, in detail later, that, that actually uh, in the kernel you end up with uh, many objects that are holding the same kind of structure, like socket or dentry, inode, whatever. And uh, if you create uh, special kinds of caches to allocate only such kinds of objects, you get uh, better efficiency, you get accounting. Suddenly, you can know how many of these sockets you have allocated. You can find uh, memory leaks more, more precisely. Uh, so that's why we now have this KMM cache create, alloc and free, uh, also calls and and eventually the kmalloc and k3 just become a special case of those. So uh, I'll be talking about the implementations we have. And uh, so it's good to know what, what we expect from a slab allocator implementation to be considered good. So we want low, mem low memory overhead. Yeah, you, you, you allocate the memory because you want to use it for something, but the slab allocator also needs some memory to do its, do its management, and you want this overhead to be as small as possible. So don't occupy much more than the actually allocated objects. Then we would like low CPU overhead, so we are not waiting for the allocations, blocking or shared locks and similar things, which can be achieved, but it costs often some of the memory overhead, so it's kind of a trade-off, and it's also very, very workload dependent. Then what's nice, if the allocator has some debugging features, like uh, if some user of the allocator is corrupting memory, you can, it's good if you can uh, enable some debug mode where you can do this poisoning and red zoning to actually catch the, the buffer overrun and uh, the call stack that caused it. So now a uh, little bit of history uh, that started before the Git tree. So I was checking this from the kernel history Git tree, which doesn't have individual commits, but only the full releases. And uh, they have some commentary that looks like it's been written by Linus in a retrospective and not at the time. So what I got from there was that the, <coughs> sorry, that the very first uh, slab allocator or came alloc allocator came in Linux 0.11. And uh, it was actually when Ted Tso first started contributing to the kernel. And it, uh, this implementation had the design decision that when you're freeing the object, you 
don't uh, pass just its pointer, but also its size. So the allocator doesn't have to take track of it itself, which simplifies the allocator, but complicates all the users. And apparently it resulted of years of pains where you had to call this 3S that passed also the size. I actually asked uh, Ted so last week uh, if he remembers this and can confirm this, this thing. And he actually had a bit of different version, like, yeah, I didn't actually wrote it, just contributed some change for that. And I don't remember the years of pain, so I guess the memory is merciful. And, or maybe there are multiple versions of the history, and who knows. And then uh, two years later, the, there was another implementation that didn't make this design decision and the size was prepended by the allocator itself. So, so from the pointer pass to the free function, you could just get to the block header and know how, how much size of object you're freeing. Then in 1997, uh, there was uh, uh, there were some papers about what we call the slab allocator today uh, that was originally implemented in uh, Sun, I think, and it introduced this uh, KMM cache alloc free and uh, create so so the per object specific caches I was talking about. And the first users of that were uh, VM area structs from memory management and structs from networking. But uh, initially it existed like in parallel to the allocator for the generic objects. Um, but uh, yeah, a few months later these were unified, which exists until today. So, so the, the KMALOC Caches are just a special kind of all the other caches. They have some predefined sizes that should work for everybody. And if somebody is allocating some odd kind of size, there, there's some fragmentation and wasted memory, but uh, that's better than uh, any of the alternatives. Uh, then there was some more evolution Several people contributed various new features uh, to the slab allocator. Uh, it was made Numa ever. I will describe that a bit as well. And then in 2006, uh, I, think, I guess it was part of the effort to make Linux run on really tiny devices with several megabytes of memory. Yeah, it was realized that the design of slab is more scalable, but uh, but it has it comes with the memory overhead, and there are use cases that cannot afford that. And so slop was uh, introduced, which was similar to the original allocator that just packed all objects together, and and the caches that are per per object are just emulated on top of that. The, the objects are not really separated. And uh, yeah, so it, it was memory, more memory efficient. It, of course, scales worse, but on the tiny device with just one core, you don't really care. And it solved the problem that existed at the time. And then uh, in 2007, Christoph Lameter came with another implementation that's called SLUB. And uh, it's uh, interesting to read in retrospect what were the motivations and compare it to uh, today's reality. So he said the slab code was too complex. Uh, I think it's completely the opposite today because SLUB has many clever uh, double CMP exchange and various tricks, so it doesn't use uh, only spin lock, and also because it has more features. It's a larger code base anyway. And uh, yeah, the other motivation was 
that uh, slab, the SLAB, had some memory overhead because of caching, uh, the objects that were allocated and freed. And uh, it, today it's actually also the opposite that SLUB is the one with more memory overhead. I will explain how, why is that in a bit. Yeah, and then, so that was July 2007 when it was introduced and surprised in October it already became a default with a brilliant uh, commit log that said, oh, some people say it's already a default, but it's not the case, so let's make it a default. And I didn't even find the patch in the mailing list archive that's for this commit, so maybe it was sent directly to Andrew by mistake, so nobody could object, and suddenly it became a default uh, upstream. So that's not how, <laughs> how we want to do uh, things today. Then uh, there were some apparently more discussions about which design is better, and of course, if there are some discussions, uh, people try to propose even newer designs that will be better than either of two, so, so Nick Pegin proposed something called SLQB that somehow tried to take the best of both, but it was a completely new implementation. Then I think Christopher Lameter didn't uh, try to introduce a new one, yeah, because Linus, Linus said, he doesn't want yet another slab allocator, so he actually tried to enhance SLUB, and he was calling it SLEB, but it was really some modification to SLUB. Then, uh, then somehow these things died out without, I didn't see a re like some real conclusion, like if they run into some issue that was unsolvable, it just means the in it just looked like the interest faded, and that was it. Eventually, some, some advantages of SLUB were ported to slap over time, but um, not these major ones like the better debugging or similar things. So that's how we ended up with three allocators, and only thanks to Linus, there are not more of them. And uh, the summary, is that slab with the A is relatively stable. Everybody knows what to expect from him. Some people were since then saying that some workloads were better there. It seems to have lower overhead today, but it doesn't have these nice debugging features, which was, I think, made the main reason why we switched to SLUB like in 5.3 kernel, but we did it after Mel uh, did extensive benchmarking to, uh, to know that we will not regress and not just because some people said it should be default. So then uh, there's slope, which was, um, I mean, this one made sense as a separate implementation because it ver was very, a specific use case that wasn't achievable at the time by uh, any other allocators, but it has some inherent uh, issues that prevent uh, making the APIs nicer, which I will talk about. And SLUB is uh, overall the best, and uh, has especially the debugging features, and it's also the only one that supports uh, preempt RT. Uh, patch set. So, uh, yeah, so what's the main difference between slab and SLUB? Uh, both work with the basic unit called the slab or slab page, which is a page allocated from the page allocator that can be four kilobytes or larger than that for more efficiency. And that's just divided to the same sized objects, which means it's a very trivial arithmetic computation to get from the object's address to its index in this slab page. 
And uh, with the page itself, there is this struct slab, which is uh, overlaid on struct page these days, which has some metadata for the page, and for example, the list head, uh, embedded list head, so it can be put into linked list. Uh, one difference uh, between SLUB and slab uh, that's not so uh, not so important is how they handle the uh, the management of the free objects because once the objects are allocated the the, the, the allocator doesn't have to care it has only has to track those that are free so SLUB embeds a linked list into the free objects themselves and slab uses some extra array which uh, it I did both have advantages in, and disadvantages, but it's not the main uh, difference of scaling and overhead. Then uh, the other common thing is uh, that these struct slabs, as I said, they have the, the embedded list that they are put into some lists. We can distinguish uh, the slabs that are partially free, fully free, uh, or fully full, so uh, that also makes them uh, uh, the, the implementation more efficient. Uh, but if we stopped at this uh, kind of design, it would be uh, not really scalable because we do have these lists of slabs per each NUMA node because uh, in 99% uh, allocating CPU wants the memory from the local node, so it makes sense to go only through the list of slabs from that same node. But uh, yeah, there, there may be many cores today on a single NUMA node, and if they needed to take the uh, common list lock that's common for the whole NUMA node, it wouldn't scale. So the main difference is uh, how, how these two uh, allocators solve this scalability problem. So slab, the SLAB, uh, on top of this list of struct page, it has uh, something called array cache, which is uh, basically just an array of objects that were recently freed and can be reallocated. When the array becomes full, it's flushed to the, to the slab pages in, in one uh, batch operation, when it becomes empty, it's refilled, it's like the magazine thing. And uh, yeah, the, the most important array is the one that's per CPU, so that means each CPU can use it without any synchronization with anybody else. I think it has to just disable preemption on something, or maybe interrupts. And there are also some uh, a bit more arrays that you need when you are freeing objects that actually belong to the other node, or but it's not that important. The main thing is that these are these arrays that at the time SLUB was introduced, the claim was that these arrays hold up too many objects, and that's where the uh, overhead uh, was, was supposed to happen. So instead, SLUB doesn't have such array caches, but what it does that is dedicates the whole slab page to each CPU for exclusive use. Uh, so the objects are there in the slab page, they are not held, held elsewhere, but they are still available to the CPU very quickly at least for the allocation, because, because then you just update the free list with some of the double CMP exchange thing, so, so you don't even need to look, uh, look the, uh, or disable the interrupts or preemption. And uh, that's very fast, but freeing can become a problem because, yeah, it's, uh, the, if you allocate some object on some core and then you are freeing it, there's a higher chance it will be from the same NUMA node, so that's what was uh, SLAP was benefiting from. 
but uh, you don't have such a high chance that the object you allocated and you are freeing it, that it actually freeing it sometime later, that it belongs to the slab page that is at the time exclusive to the CPU because you might have depleted the slab page and allocated a new one or or it might be a different CPU doing the freeing than the allocation. And then suddenly there's still this lockless CM, CMP exchange operation that can free to the slab page that's not exclusive to your CPU. But it at least means that you are probably fetching some cache line from different CPUs cache and that becomes slower. Or sometimes you have to you have to actually go to the shared list and take the uh, log. So, so the freeing is kind of uh, unpredictable and not always the fastest possible, where for slab, you always have this per CPU array. Uh, so that's one of probably the main thing why SLU beacons be inefficient from, for uh, less efficient than slab for some kinds of workloads. So now why I want to reduce uh, the existing three implementations back to one? Yeah, because it's uh, more code to maintain. You can see there's thousands of lines for each allocator and also the, the, the more similar ones have a common layer that abstracts away the, op the common operation which sits in another C file. So then, uh, then there's yeah, either we would have to duplicate this common code everywhere to get best possible inlining, or we risk that without some LTO, we are making extra uh, calls on the call stack from one C file to another. Yeah, and that's what we do today. So it might have been more effective if there was such a single uh, implementation then there are various other features that uh, that are tied into the slab allocators, like the MemCG KMEM support, the Kassan and KFANS. Yeah, and and uh, the people who implemented these always had a choice, like, do I implement it only for slab or SLUB or both? So many of them actually implemented it for both, which means they had to do more work. Yeah, and some like the preempt RT only went with one of them, which I think was the bet better choice at the time. Yeah, and as I, as I said, uh, the slop, the main problem with slop, which doesn't suffer from most of those other issues because it's special enough that anybody knows they don't have to implement stuff for it, is that uh, it blocks some useful feature that was at some point requested by, for example, the XFS developer that that uh, if you allocate something from the KMM cache alloc from the specific cache, it should be possible to free it also by the K3, which is normally for, uh, counterpart of the KM alloc, because then you don't have to track from which cache the object uh, uh, has come. And XFS has layers on top of everything in the kernel, so they had some unifying functions that was freeing stuff, and it would have been nice for them, if uh, useful for them if they could just use k free and don't track if it's from a k malloc cache or some other one. Uh, and also there's k free RCU, which is uh, delayed freeing for stuff from KMalloc, and there was no counterpart for KMM cache free because it, the RCU head doesn't have space for the pointer to the cache. So, so if we allowed K free for KMM cache alloc allocations, it will also automatically allow the K free RCU. Yeah, and maybe in the future, if there's just a single allocator, we can come more come up with more API improvements that would be impossible or or hard to do with uh, multiple implementations. Yeah, so this is why slop K3 
cannot uh, actually support easily the k free of k mem cache alloc objects. And uh, the thing is that it really packs both kinds into every page. But for the k malloc objects, it has to prepend the header, like the very first k malloc that didn't need the free as, uh, free as call to be told the, the, the size. But for the kmem cache alloc, it doesn't need to prepend the header because it can get the size by using the kmem cache pointer that is passed to the kmem cache free. Yeah, and uh, suddenly if every object was possibly being made possible to free with k free, the only solution would be to start prepending the headers with the size everywhere because you, because you would have no guarantee that you would get the cache pointer when freeing. Yeah, and that's why uh, SLAP and SLUB can do this uh, because they can easily get to the, from the object they are supposed to be freed to the respective uh, struct page, which is overlaid struct SLAP and then that one has the pointer to the KMM cache and then there they can get this, or they don't actually need the size because the, the, the whole management is done differently. So they don't need to actually get the pointer to the cache from the KMM cache free, although it's somewhat more, more efficient if they do, but the, the difference is not very large. So, and uh, to make things works, uh, worse, if we did want to implement uh, K3 in slope and started prepending headers everywhere, it would be even worse than adding just like two bytes or four bytes because of alignment uh, guarantees that are there for the K-malloc allocations. And currently on some ARM CPUs, you would need uh, sometimes 100 pet and uh, align everything to 128 bytes and suddenly you would be aligning also the headers to 128 bytes because you cannot give away the rest of that block to somebody who might submit a DMA on that and uh, the, uh, corrupt the header. And uh, so yeah, slop would be made more wasteful and because the objective was to make it as uh, efficient as possible, it would go against the use case. So what we could have do was like try to re-implement it differently, but, but maybe it would be easier if we could just remove it. Does anyone uh, still need it? So, so after the last plumbers, when we discussed this, then there was no objection, at least in the room. I uh, proposed removing slope allocator, and I even checked if uh, there are some configs out there that say config slope, of, or I checked what the open WRT does, because that used to be a distro for small routers, wireless routers. And it turns out now they support devices only with 128 megabytes or maybe 64, and they use SLUB already, so, so they shouldn't care. Uh, somebody pointed out there are some def configs in the tree that do select slope. Turned out that most of them was just from the past and they could have switched. There was just one board with uh, eight megabytes memory that where the maintainer actually tried switching to SLUB and said, oh, but now I run out of memory and boot, and I didn't before. So what I tried to do instead of keeping slope was to actually cut some features of the SLUB allocator uh, that would result in uh, worse scalability and give up the debugging. Uh, and uh, but uh, have less memory overhead uh, for for these kind of use cases. And it turns out that uh, this was sufficient for this board. 
And uh, yeah, there, there's a new config option, but but it only shuffles some code that's already existed. It's not another implementation, it's just a modification, so it's okay. Because similar kinds of code was already used also when you enabled debugging, then the per CPU caches were also not used and so on. So in uh, 6.2, the, the tiny option was introduced and slope deprecated. And because nobody complained since then, then in 6.4, 6.4 RC1, it's completely removed. And yeah, I hope that will last until the end of the RC series. So that means you can now use K3 or K3 RCU to the KMM cache objects because the uh, remaining allocators are fine with that. So, uh, so that means the next step would be to remove the SLAB allocator because yeah, SLUB should be superior unless there are some regressions for some workload. And whenever this was attempted in the past, uh, there were always complaints from some people that always included also Google people that, yeah, they had some uh, regressions with some networking workloads because they probably suffered from the inefficient freeing in SLUB not hitting the fast path. But uh, that was uh, actually tackled from a different side meanwhile because the networking guys, uh, Jasper, uh, I can pronounce his uh, show name, he uh, implemented KMAM, uh, KMAM cache alloc and free in bulk bulk alloc and bulk free, which which uh, means they can like amortize the overhead uh, and somehow that makes SLUB already uh, okay for them. And yeah, so, uh, and recently Google did some internal testing and uh, comparison and posted result, which didn't show any specific specific concern, yeah, some, some of the workloads uh, were better on SLUB, some on slab, but it wasn't like anything drastic. And I wonder if it was all, all partially because of some noise, because for example, the same workload behaved differently on AMD and Intel, which I wouldn't expect to make such a different difference. So maybe it uh, was noisy. Uh, in any case, they don't object to the removal anymore. So actually that's an uh, update from LSFMM, which we had last week. And there was this session about slap removal and yeah, the Google guys in the room didn't object. And what was a bit surprised for me that, that they actually said these times they see the extra memory overhead uh, as the main issue and not the performance. Uh, so that's, that's different from when SLUB was introduced, it was supposed to have lower memory issue, but that was because it caches the slab pages per each CPU and probably at the time there were not so many CPUs as there are today. So today uh, when each CPU or core or the hyperthread has its own dedicated slab page. Suddenly that, that sums up to uh, more overhead than, than the array caches of SLAB. So they would like to, this to be looked into, uh, but it's not a prerequisite for them to agree on the SLAB removal. So, so after, so maybe next week I will uh, go ahead and propose that. Uh, and we also discussed uh, what could be possible API improvements once we have just single allocator left. And what I see is that there may be various use cases of 
that could benefit from introducing some kind of opt-in, not automatically for caches, opt-in introduction of something similar to the array caches of slab, so some simple arrays of cached objects that, that you know uh, they are locally available without any locking. And the use cases would be, for example, I know that the BPF allocator was created on top of slab because they needed uh, some of the cache that would be useful in NMI context, for example, and you cannot use slab allocator uh, today in NMI context. But if there was a per CPU cache, you could have used it at least until you deplete it. But yeah, maybe for, yeah. So they have some caches and they have to uh, take into account that sometimes it must fail because uh, you cannot cache unlimited number of objects and you cannot refill in NMI. Another use case would be some, maybe something like we do today with mempools, again, done on top of allocators that you could guarantee some successful allocations with this kind of cache, but only until a given size. Um, yeah, and the, the main uh, advantage of doing this in the slab allocator is that all these guys wouldn't have to re-implement the your thing and we would integrate it nicely into the rest of the MM because, for example, at least what I uh, read about the BPF allocator, it can eventually cache a lot of memory and isn't tied to the memory shrinkers mechanism in memory reclaim. So it can cause OOM, but if uh, memory management guys would implement this, uh, that would be handled. Uh, Actually, another use case was brought up by Joel Fernandez from Google, who works on RCU, and uh, there's some uh, K-free RCU might sleep variant of the K-free RCU, which uh, doesn't have, uh, doesn't need the embedded RCU head, RCU head in the object you are freeing which is nice for the users, but for the RCU, it means they have to store the, uh, the objects somewhere um, on some pages that are full of pointers. And if, the, it, if this was done in slab allocator itself, it could be also more efficient. And uh, Gabriel uh, was telling me about some caching that would be useful for IOU ring. So that's maybe another use case. So that's all I got. So thank you. And if there are any questions. So one question which came up most of you during LSF is that um, you said Kmalak is brilliant or should be used for um, areas smaller than page size. But what about allocations of page size? Um, or put that around, is there a difference be between calling calling alloc page and kmalloc page size? Yeah, yeah, the allocator supports that because we don't want everybody to like, to distinguish, oh, am I allocating too small one or too, but, but it's offloaded to the page allocator, so there's not much of a difference. I think it, the largest one with order one, where it still has uh, a cache with all the accounting, but anything larger is just passed to the page allocator, and it's still accounted as a slab in meminfo, but doesn't have like a tracked, tracked row in slab info. So they're just for convenience. That was more, um, so the one thing was the performance. Well, basically what would happen if we were start converting all our pages over to Kmalloc? Because that's one of the issues we are looking at in the context of the large block IO effort. Uh, 
yeah, the overhead should be minimal. So if it's convenient for you, okay. But yeah, it, it doesn't make sense to convert every color just because we can. But if you need that, uh, that oh, that's just one more call in a call stack. Okay, so nobody else, thanks again.